how can we support our clients as they adjust to a change in supply chains? So supply chains have been the most impacted or, or disrupted during the coronavirus. Um, you know, even the term supply chain uh, has almost become a buzzword in the news, um, but it's, it's a very real concern. Um, you know, like Bella was talking about earlier, a lot of the products are out there, um, but the issue is getting them in the hands of the right people in an efficient way. Um, so for, for our customers, we tend to see two different um, parts of the supply chain. Um, the first is how we get the raw materials uh, to the manufacturer so that they can make the thing that they need to make. Um, and then the second part is once they have the finished goods, how do we get those to the consumer, um, you know, to the shelf so that they can, they can be purchased and used. Um, so I guess starting on the, the finished goods side, you know, there's always been a focus historically on speed from the end of the line to the shelf. You know, what can we do to make that process um, as quick, as efficient, as lean as possible? Um, and it's become so lean that it's left that supply chain vulnerable to any disruptions. Uh, so like we saw with the coronavirus, when there was any sort of, of blip in the supply chain, um, you know, it, to it totally derailed the whole train. So in the short term, that's what leaves the shelves empty. Um, so when you, when you go to buy your, your stock of toilet paper um, right after everyone starts quarantining in those first couple weeks, that's what results in those um, short-term shortages. Um, so the way that we can help our customers uh, navigate that is by helping them evaluate their, their material handling and distribution systems um, and determining options for flexibility. Maybe that's not flexibility that they're going to use every day, day to day, um, but it's helping them develop the plan B. So if, um, if X happens, then we have Y. Uh, so on a master plan level, you know, we can, can look at that, you know, to understand how many different SKUs each line can run, each facility can run, um, and how we create the network uh, between those lines and those facilities to make sure that all of the bases are covered. So even if you have a primary plan, you can always jump to your secondary plan uh, if there's a need. So on the raw material supply chain side, that's what would impact more your, your long-term shortages. So a shortage that you would see hit the shelf um, months after the initial cause or disruption to the supply chain. Um, so an example that you might see of that right now um, are diet sodas. So a large quantity of um, artificial sweeteners are produced in China. So once that supply chain slowed down, there was a restriction on the amount of uh, artificial sweeteners coming to, to bottlers and canners in the U.S. Um, so that uh, it wasn't an immediate shock to the system um, since there was already some, some stuff available here, uh, but you might see that that, that hit, that impact um, a couple months later um, now uh, when, when you try to go, go find your diet sodas on the shelf. So um, you know, as, as a result, to help our, our customers with that, um, we would see them diversifying their supply chains, uh, again, looking for their plan B and uh, and potentially repatriating some of those materials um, closer to where they are are processed or manufactured um, to the to the point of use. I think Jenna, just to add on to what you said, that was really some good examples. We've been getting a lot of questions from our own customers around uh, capital equipment and can they add to their existing production lines to be able to do uh, some of to be able to address some of the issues they've seen in their supply chain. So how can we quickly go from, I'll go back to my original example of the, of the toilet paper, how do we go from industrial size rolls to consumer grade rolls? Um, and how do we go from those 200 pound boxes of broccoli to two pound bags of broccoli? Um, and so those questions are coming up right now and, and we're seeing some trends in, in some of our customers looking to have the capability to on a, you know, flip of a switch, go from one type of product to another based on the need. Um, now, there's some challenges with that, which I, I'm sure a lot of you guys on the call know this, but um, capital equipment, you can't order it and get it overnight, right? So there's a process of, uh, of buying capital uh, equipment for your facility that you start out with, with what you need it to do and help work on the design 
and then you have your approval drawing process and you've got your lead time and then you've got your FAT and then you've got the delivery, depending on what kind of equipment you're talking about, you could be talking about a month or two or you could be talking about um, eight to 12 months. Um, and so looking at what does that capital expenditure require in the short term in terms of wait time and cost, and then what does that payback look like in the long term to bridge some of those uh, supply chain uh, hiccups or challenges uh, that we're seeing right now. So I think there's certainly some interest that we've seen um, in certain customers looking at diversifying their capabilities in their production arena.